Good evening, Patricia. Hey, it's 6.30. So we'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Let me speak up a little bit louder where you can hear me. We'll go ahead and get started tonight. And while I'm looking in the camera, I need to shave. Hey, Jimmy, Caroline, good to have y'all on here tonight. Hello to y'all. Well, let's, uh, let's start by praying, and then uh, we'll study. Okay, Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus Christ, your son. We thank you that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the lifter of our head. He is the source of our peace. He is the source of our strength. And he is the source of our salvation. We thank you, Lord, for all that he has done for us. Now, Father, we pray that you would open up our hearts, open our minds, that we might receive, Lord, what you're trying to show us today. And we thank you in all these things we pray. Amen. All right. Well, it's good to have everybody on here tonight. So tonight <clears throat> in our Bible study, I want you to get your Bibles and Turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. Tonight we will, we will end our um, expository. We're going to wrap up our expository study of 1 Corinthians 15. It's been a great study. I think next week we'll start on the book of James. If the Lord is willing and he doesn't do something different. Okay? So... You just get over there and you take a few notes. But I'm going to kind of go first. I'm going to recap what we've studied the past two weeks. And then we'll go and we will study the uh, chap uh, verses 35 through 58. So in verses 1 through 11 in the first week, we basically uh, studied about the resurrection. There was a question amongst the church at Corinth. Was there a resurrection or not? And, uh, and Paul said that if there is no resurrection, that the race we run is in vain and we disqualify ourselves. But he proved that Christ died, that he conquered death, that he was buried, and that he did rise from the grave. He rose for our sins and he rose uh, to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness in accordance to 300 prophecies. And we studied those that first week. Not all 300. <laughs> we studied several of, of the prophecies that proclaim the resurrection of Christ and foretold of his resurrection. So there is proof there that he, there is a resurrection and that Jesus was resurrected. By our witnesses, first to those who, who, who saw him at the tomb on that Easter morning, then to they were his disciples, then to the apostles, the twelve, and, and then to at least 500 more people, and then to James, it says, and finally to the apostle Paul himself, who said of him, and Paul, in that first 11 verses, Paul said of himself, but by the grace of God, the grace, the kindness, the blessing, the concession, the credit, and the favor of God, he said this statement. We, it was such a great teaching where he said, I am what I am. And then we discovered that his, Paul said this, his grace toward me is not in vain. And I can say that too. And uh, because he takes what has been shaped and scarred by sin and circumstances, and he uses it. Aren't you glad? Because I, I tell you, I'm an imperfect person, but many of the imperfections that are found in me, God has seen fit to take those imperfections and perfect them for his glory and use them. Ain't that, isn't that wonderful? All the scars and all the bumps and all the bruises, all the life experiences that we've gone through, Christ takes those and uses those for his glory so that many people, in verse 11, many people will believe and be saved. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 11. So that's what we studied the first week. And then on the second week, we studied 
from verses 12 to verse 34. Now, uh, there, there are 58 verses, so we were able to break it down into three different uh, uh, studies. So in verses 12 through 34, what we discovered, I'm summarizing, then we're going to move on in, into verse 35. That there are many people who name the name of Christ, but don't believe in it. They, don't, they, they name the name of Christ, but they don't believe in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So it, their belief in Christ is in vain. Some of them don't even believe that Christ had any kind of divinity. And there are many that say they believe in all the attributes of Christ, his death, his burial, his divine nature, his virgin birth. and all. They, they believe those things. They say they do, but they don't act like they believe it because their actions don't reflect the words that come out of their mouth. So their faith does not uh, reflect what they say they believe. And um, that is why when we read these scriptures, what he said, he said they, they, they say it, they believe it, but because they don't believe it or act like they believe it, these scriptures can, if we're not taken personally, that's one thing we said last week. You have to take revelation personally. You cannot take revelation and ascribe it to someone else. Well, that's for that person, or this is for that group, or this is for my wife or husband, for my children. No, you have to take the revelation personally. It has to come into your mind and in your heart because the revelation is intended to change your life. So if you do hear and you say you believe, but you do not follow through and you don't receive this revelation personally, then there's some things that may happen to you. And these are horrible things. But in Matthew 25, 41, I'm just going to give you this one from our study last week. Then he'll just say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. See that? So if we, if, we, if we ascribe, if we get revelation, number one, if we deny the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, uh, there's no hope for us. Hey, hey, Ginger, and, good to, and, friend, and Sue, good to see you on here, and Darlene, Ronnie. And, so if we do deny those things, there's no hope for us. But if we say we believe and don't act like we believe, then we're going to be in, it's going to be a little bit of shock, but it should. It will, will not really, in my belief, it won't be a surprise because you're going to know. But it won't be a shock. I mean, it'll be a shock because you're going to hear him say, depart from me, I never knew you. So we got to take these things personally. And Christ did die. He died one for all. He died. Adam, through Adam, death came, and through Christ, life came. Glory to God. Christ conquered sin, death. He defeated death, and he arose from the grave. And here's the great promise. Christ was then the first of the resurrection. And then the Christian, a believer, a true believer, will be the second, and that will be at his coming. And so then we talk about that. We talk about what happens in the meantime. And just to sum that up for you, to be absent with the body, from the body is to be present with the Lord. So <clears throat> if there is no resurrection, this is what we studied last week. If there is no resurrection, well, we might as well just have a party. We might as well eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. And if there is no resurrection, then... The sad thing about that is, if there is no resurrection, then what you are living now is the best you'll ever hope for. So you better enjoy life while you can. But let me tell you something, you can't. Because this life is hard. This life is horrible. This life is full of disappointment. It's full of death. It's full of destruction. 
It's full of all kind of anguish. And so we need to know that. And so if this eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, that's a sad commentary, a sad thought that this would be the best. So that's, that's what we talked about last week. And then finally, finally last week, uh, he said, wake up and stop sinning. And again, we'll remind you that this, this teaching, this uh, letter, what we call a book of the Bible, is a letter to the church of Corinth, is to Christians. And he's saying, Christian, stop sinning. And that's a great message right there for us. Stop sinning. Wake up, stop sinning. So <clears throat> now, that's the last two weeks. So this week, we're going to take an in-depth look in, from verses 35 to verse 58, doing this expository teaching out of the book of 1 Corinthians. And we're going to take an in-depth look at the resurrection the resurrected body and what it will be like, okay? So if you're ready, let's go and look at verse number 35. But some, and this is a question, right? And I know you've had this question, and I've had this question. Who? I mean, most of us have had this question. How, someone asked, someone will ask, how are the dead raised, and what kind of body do they come? With what kind of body do they come? So we've all asked that. So if we look at media and we look at depictions in media, we see people sitting on a cloud, strumming a harp with little wings on their back and a halo over their head. Well, that's not true. None of that is true. It's the farthest thing from the truth there's ever would be. You're not going to have angels' wings on your back because you're not going to be an angel. You're going to be a resurrected Christian, that's what you're going to be. You're not going to have a halo over your head. You're going to have the glory of God on you. And I'm going to explain that in just a minute. And, and, and that is to say, though, now, that this resurrected body is not going to be like this body. Okay? In verse 36, it says, You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. So, in order to obtain a resurrected body, we got to die. So this body is going to be, not going to be the same, but it will be similar, okay? Because when you sow a seed, what comes up, it looks like the seed. The harvest looks like seed. You put a, corn, a kernel of corn in the ground, right? It comes up as a corn stalk. Well, that corn stalk don't look like the kernel of corn. You understand? It, it's it's a it's a green, you know, and and got great leaves and all and these cobs and all that of corn, but it doesn't look like the little little kernel that you put in the ground. You put a little watermelon seed in there, a little black or green or white little watermelon seed in the ground. Uh, what comes is it doesn't look like that seed, so it will be similar. It will contain part of the old, right? But it will be different. It'll be similar. Now, in verse 37, And what you sow is not the body that that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other type of grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. So that's what I was saying. So there'll be it'll be similar, but it won't be the same. And so I wanted to get that. There's a distinction made between humans and all other creatures in this next verse. Because in human beings, no, Caroline, we won't be old glory to God. We won't have arthritis. We won't have diabetes. We won't have heart disease. Lord, have mercy. He praise the Lord for that. And um, But he shows us in verse 39, he said, For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans and another for animals. So again, I will repeat this. 
We are not animals. So some people say the human animal. That is a lie from the pits of hell. To make you, <clears throat> to make you, when you believe that you're just a human animal, that means that the glory of God is not in you. Now life, all life comes from God. But not all life has the spirit, the eternal spirit of God in it. I, 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 I taught him uh, a preaching on this just a few weeks ago. God has set eternity in the hearts of men. God has made us different, see, from the animals. Our, our spirit is eternal. <clears throat> an animal, when an animal, when the breath of life goes out, it goes back to God. See what I'm saying? And, and uh, so... That's the difference. He said one for animal, another for birds, and another for fish. See, he, he, he gives it. Listen, and so you can take and you can say, well, now, uh, I, I learned this and I learned that. Well, I, you know, that's great. I'm glad you learned that. But I'm telling you what the Word of God says, what the creator of the universe says, okay? So in human, the human seed, is the only one that can be raised eternal. Eternal. Eternity is in our hearts. So, uh, so he says that here. So now, in verses 40 and 41, hey Kelly, uh, we see the that the glory of the respected body is the glory of heaven. Or the resurrected body, excuse me, I typed that in wrong, is the glory of heaven. All right? <clears throat> And that the body we now have now has a particular glory and a particular function. But the new body is different. It's similar, but it's different. Okay, verse 40 and verse 41. There are heavenly bodies, and they have their glory, and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is another. So you, there's a glory to this body. You're created in the image and the likeness of God. But when you receive your resurrected body, it's a different glory. And he makes that distinction. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon. So the greater light and the, and the, and the small light, but they both have their distinct glory. And another glory of the stars, for stars different from star in glory. So there's a brighter star and a dimmer star, but they all have their own glory. So what he's saying there is that we have this body now that has a particular glory and function, but in the resurrected body, there will be a different glory. And I'm going to show you that in just a minute, you, and you'll be excited. And then... Then he points out that there's reasons for this difference, okay? Uh, this body we have now is perishable. The body that we will have is imperishable. This body that we have now is created in dishonor. There are, there are functions in this body that are necessary for life on earth. But with the new body, we won't have to listen they're, they're, they're things that will not happen to us, biologically speaking. So this body has dishonor, right? But the body to come is glorious. This body was formed in weakness. The new body will, will, will function in power. This body is natural, but our new body will be spiritual. So... So it is, he said in verse 42, with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, is perishable, like a kernel of grain. It's perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, but it's raised in glory. See, dishonor, uh, the, the functions of this body that are, you know, meant for... Uh, not to be seen. You know, we hide and we, you know, we're, they're discreet. And we do that because it's not an honorable thing. But uh, it'll be raised in glory. We won't have, There's things that we have to do now we won't have to do then. And I, I ain't going to spell that out to you. 
you can imagine what they are. You won't have to do those things anymore. It is sown in weakness, but it's raised in power. This old weak body, this weak flesh that, that tends to lean and, and give in to sin no more. We have power once and for all over it. It is sown in natural, raised in spiritual. If there's a natural body, watch this, there's also a spiritual body. So what we're talking about uh, this week is we're talking about the, the question that we all have. And Paul started that in verse 35. He said, well, we got a new body. What's it going to be like? Well, he's explaining to us what it's going to be like. If it's a living, a living being in a living spirit. Thus it is written, the first Adam became a living being, right? So you have a living being. That's what we all are. So the last Adam became a life-giving spirit, right? So that's what he became. And if he became it, remember, as we studied last week, he was the first. But to come at the second coming, we will also inherit our heavenly body, our glorified body, as, as Christians like to say. But... So Adam, it was, he says, but it, it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural. So the natural is first and then the spiritual is second. And, and so let me, let me tell you something. I, I'm, and I, I'm thinking I'm going to share this part of my message Sunday morning. God gave me one today. Uh, and, and something that I want you to remember and I want to remind you of this. What you see in the natural is not what is reality. It is what is in the spiritual is actually is what really is reality. Okay? <clears throat> you say, well, <laughs> ain't nothing over. I understand. But Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers and authority. So if you see something taking place in the natural, it's already taking place in the spiritual. So there's two there's two worlds, so to speak, two dimensions, the natural and the spiritual. Well, to receive the spiritual body, the glorified body, the natural body comes first. And, as he said, it is like a seed going to the ground and it will bear forth a fruit, a harvest. And here's the reason why. One is from the dust and one is from the spirit. In verse 47, the first man was from the earth, a man of dust. A second man is from heaven. And as was the man of dust, so also are those who are the dust. And, it, and as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of the dust, Adam, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven, Jesus. Aren't you glad of that? Get rid of this old dusty body, as Caroline said. Won't get old, won't get weak, won't get tired. I won't need these anymore. Been wearing them for about 10 years. I have to wear them all the time now. My eyes are getting weaker, getting cataracts in them. I got this big gray spot back here on my head and you know, this thing is wearing out, which we all will. But one day, glory to God, because of the promise of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, him being the first and the promise that as a believer in Jesus Christ, washed in the blood of the Lamb, saved by heaven's glory, I will one day receive that glorified body. And let me give you a clue. Let me give you a little clue that's, not, that's found in some other scriptures of what it what it'll be like, what this glorified body. Are you ready? I, I, man, I, this excites me, but it also makes me think, wow, listen to this. In Luke 24, verse 15 and 16, these two men were walking from uh, Jerusalem on the way to Emmaus. They were talking and they were discussing together and then Jesus himself drew near and went with them but their eyes were kept from recognizing that see that's a glorified body 
say, I'm just saying, watch this. And then in verse 36, they went back to the disciples and they because Jesus revealed himself to them. And when they saw it, they said, did not our hearts leap inside? And he, so he had revealed himself to them. They went back to the, tell the disciples and the disciples said, I don't believe that. But in verse 36 of Luke 24, he says, as they were talking about these things, Jesus stood among them and said, peace to you. He said, he just, he just appeared? Yeah, because watch this. In John 20, verse 19, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were, were for fear of the Jews, the doors were locked. And then guess what happened? Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And then in verse 26, it says of John 20, Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them, and the doors were locked again. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Now, you're saying, well, what's this glorified body going to be like? Well, I can tell you one thing. This is Jesus and his glorified body. And he, was, he, could, he could be in one place here and then be in this place over here. He could go, uh, the doors can be locked and he could walk through the walls or, or get through them somehow or another. You see what I'm saying? And he knew, he knew those things he, and he knows. See, so this is just a sneak peek for us. I have no clue exactly what this glorified body is going to be, but that's a little sneak peek, a little clue as to what it might be like. Because it is no longer natural. It is spiritual. It's a, it's a new body. has new characteristics. has new DNA. has a new makeup. It's no longer of the dust. But it's of heaven. I love stuff like this. And here's a statement that he made. Okay. In verse 50. He says, I tell you this, brothers. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So what he's saying, well, you can't get to heaven in the natural. You'll never walk the streets of gold. Uh, you just can't be taken from here to there. There has to be a change. There has to be a transformation. You die. And if, if perhaps in another scripture we might study sometime, um, you don't die, but you're caught up to be with the Lord, Then, but your body's still going to change into that spiritual body. So, glory to God. So, that describes, this next few verses describes that great resurrection day. And watch this. Verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Mystery means something that we don't quite understand. And we're trying to figure it out. We shall not all sleep. Sleep, sleep means this. Listen, I've had many, many, my mama, you know, my father-in-law just went to sleep. My daddy went to sleep. I have many dear friends and relatives who have went to sleep. And I say they went to sleep because they were Christians. If you're a Christ follower, you go to sleep. You don't die because death has, your body dies, but you don't die. If you don't, if you're not a believer in Christ, you die. And you go away from God. So he says it this way, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. That's what he said at the second coming back last week we studied. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. So those who are alive and remain, they're, they're going to be caught up and be changed. Those who have gone to sleep, their heavenly spirit 
will connect with their new glorified body. And do you understand how that's going to happen? I don't either. That's why he said it's a mystery. But he does say it's going to happen. If anybody tells you that they know all the ins and outs of how that's going to happen, well, I must be part of, smarter than Paul because he said it's a mystery. <clears throat> so when that happens, when the perishable in verse 53 must put on the imperishable, this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come the past, the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 55. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you got the victory tonight, he'll a like a love or something on there. I've got the victory because I am a born again. I, I, listen, he came, he found me, he saved me, he redeemed me, he set me free, and I didn't even know when all that happened what was awaiting me, the joy, the peace, and the happiness that I received from Christ, the overcoming faith and power to walk in this earth and on this earth. But then, oh, glory to God, one day I am going to receive this glorified body and be with Jesus forever and ever and ever. And this is what he affirms. In this last verse, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, <clears throat> because you have this hope, okay? Therefore. So in light of all these things, that's what a therefore means. It means in light of everything that I've just said, therefore, in light of that, mean, that's what therefore means. Because I said this, you can have this. Watch this. Because I said this, then be steadfast. Be immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Glory to God. That is one of the things that we've talked about these last few weeks. He said... Run this race so that you're not disqualified. Run, don't run this race in vain. Don't, and the reason he was saying that is because many don't believe in the resurrection. If you don't believe in the resurrection, there's no hope for you. Many don't believe or, or believe, they say they believe and don't act. So then they're running the race in vain. But he said, if you believe what I have just written to you, then move forth in this steadfast immovable hope so in in your race and your labor and your work and your weariness and your just just sometimes this drudgery of life and getting knocked down and having to get back up over and over and over again uh, and seeing Sometimes it seems like everything I do and everything I say is not having any effect because people are getting harder and meaner and all that. He said, don't, don't, don't look down. Always abounding in the work. So keep working, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So all this that you've endured, all that you've been going through, all the times that you've prayed and all the times that you share the love of Jesus Christ, uh, either by word or deed, it's not in vain because you have a great promise and you have a great hope. And then we've laid it all out these past three weeks now. It's the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And because he lives, I have hope for the future. Amen. 
Well, I've enjoyed studying this with you. And we're going to wrap it up tonight. We've been going about 35 minutes, so it's time. So, uh, if the Lord's willing, we'll start on the book of James next week and see what uh, the Lord will say to us out of that. Amen? So, until I see you soon, I'll see you later. God bless you.